Okay, it's 10.01, so why don't we go ahead and get started? We have a very packed, but I think uh, very uh, uh, exciting, informative uh, webinar today. Um, we're lucky to have three outstanding uh, stroke neurologists to speak to us about perspectives um, regarding acute stroke care, maintaining quality and guidelines in India, Brazil, and Canada. Um, so welcome everybody. Thanks for taking the time to join us. Our, our format is that we're going to have the three speakers, um, each speaking for 10 minutes and 30 minutes for discussion. Um, I am one of your co-moderators. My name is Pooja Khatri. I'm at University of Cincinnati, a stroke neurologist here. Um, and a professor of neurology, um, and I also do clinical trials. Um, a couple of housekeeping things before I turn things over to my co-moderator, uh, mainly that um, please do keep yourself on mute, uh, if, and um, we will use the, the question and answer box, and we will be watching this very closely. So, so please feel free to post questions as we move along. Feel free to put them in during the, the talks themselves. After each of these 10 minute talks, we have 30 minutes for discussion. And, um, and I think we're gonna be talking about some very complex issues. And so um, I, I hope we, we have time to really kind of dig in a little bit. Um, finally, uh, uh, other than the question and answer box, um, just try not to use a chat box because I, I know I've been confused by that before. If it's, it's much cleaner for us to track if you use the question and answer box. Any other housekeeping issues, Alina, that I might've missed? No. Okay, thank you. So let me turn, turn things over to my co-moderator, uh, Guillaume Turk. Many thanks, Pooja. My name is Guillaume Turk. I'm a stroke neurologist uh, in Saint Anne Hospital in Paris and Associate Professor of Neurology at the University of Paris. Um, so it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, the first speaker, um, Patrice Lindsay, who is the Director of Systems Change and Stroke Program at the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Canada. She has led the development and implementation of the Canadian Stroke Guidelines for over 15 years. And uh, she was part of the team that created uh, the WSO Stroke Guideline and Roadmap. Uh, the title of her lecture today is Adapting Stroke Care to COVID in Canada. So overall, the three of us are gonna to talk to you today about guidelines and the response to COVID-19 and how that greatly, greatly impacted stroke care. Um, so I have no disclosures for this particular talk. Very early on, we found out that COVID affects stroke in many ways. We start to see more people with stroke. Um, publications that started to come out said that people who've had a previous stroke were three times more likely to die from COVID. Um, people with high blood pressure were 2.5 and people with heart disease actually were four times higher. So it was a major concern for us. At the same time, people were terrified and we were just talking among ourselves and it was very clear that um, people being afraid, they were afraid to go to hospitals. So we stopped seeing a lot of the younger or the milder strokes or TIA patients and the emergency room became very empty, which was a great concern for us. Um, what we understand, started to understand within the systems that um, COVID led to was delays in um, ambulance response, not that they were getting to a scene faster, but they had to take the time to protect themselves and the, the uh, patient and the family around them. We, um, many emergency departments initiated a code stroke, a protective code stroke, which was very important to protect our patients. There was delays um, just in terms of access to CT scanners and the need to wash down and clean um, scanners more rigorously in between cases. And a lot of stroke units that were, because they most of them had negative pressure, were taken over as COVID units. Um, and as a result, many of the stroke staff were either caring for stroke or COVID patients or redeployed. So overall, the entire system got impacted. Um, <clears throat> we recently published a paper that showed um, where all the COVID cases and what the outcomes would be. And what we discovered is, you know, kind of shot ourselves in the foot a little bit with higher, um, highly advanced um, countries with high, higher health system where we're saving more people with heart disease and stroke, we realized that as a result, um, 
people who develop COVID because they already lived with a lot of these conditions were at a higher risk of, of mortality. So, you know, countries such as Canada and the U.S. have higher uh, mortality rate from COVID in people with our conditions, but it's just because of the nature of the health systems that we were saving more people to begin with. All of this led to a clear need to take action. That we couldn't just kind of let COVID unfold without providing direction to those care and stroke patients. So as you can see here, all around the world, all of our individual stroke societies started to put together some sort of a statement, whether it be a full guideline or a position statement or consensus statement around um, caring for patients with stroke during COVID. So here's an example of a few of them. You're going to hear from both Sheila and Jaraj today about how their country responded, and I'm going to focus on um, what happened in Canada. And we were quite aligned with, you know, and had lots of conversations with Australia and the US um, and England. One of the important things that I started to allude to earlier is COVID wasn't just an issue in acute care. It's not just about that acute stroke in those first hours. That COVID has impacted people with stroke across the entire continuum of care. You know, right from um, even being awareness right through to prevention, access, and end of life. So the first major change that we all saw, and literally within a day or a few days, was a major pivot from in-person care, especially in ambulatory settings, to virtual care. In stroke, we were lucky that most um, regions in Canada already had active acute telestroke programs. So for that real-time support of a patient in a smaller community um, to support giving thrombolysis and decision-making regarding the transfer for um, endovascular. But now, after many years of fighting to get um, virtual care into um, prevention clinics and into rehab, all of a sudden everybody was doing it, but without being prepared. So our first messages within our guidance, our guidance statement that we put out were around, you know, we need to do virtual care and that um, people need to use the toolkits we've developed, which we developed a very extensive toolkit and be guided and to learn how to do it properly because initially there wasn't a lot of great um, processes in place and people were struggling, clinicians were struggling, especially allied health who hadn't really had the same exposure that perhaps some of the um, acute physicians had. And that a lot of the barriers had to be addressed and removed around access to technology, bandwidth, which was a major issue across the world. Um, and especially for, for people in the community settings on, on having the equipment and the technology needed. So we put together a toolkit for healthcare providers. And then we also worked with a group of 20 patients to put together the patient version. And we're really encouraging all of our clinicians when you're booking a virtual appointment to send this document, which is available on our website, to patients, which really just gives them how to actually participate in the virtual care visit and be a meaningful, meaningfully engaged. So I'm not going to go through it, but we do have it available and we've had really good feedback. As I mentioned, the emergency department and public awareness was a major issue. So we changed our FAST. We added a message at the top of our FAST um, messaging to say, even during a pandemic, stroke is still an emergency, don't hesitate. So we had a mass campaign go on. Within our guidance, um, we emphasize that all of our existing evidence-based stroke guidelines should still be followed. Like we need to continue to provide good stroke care in accordance with evidence-based practice, even in this environment. Um, I talked about the awareness piece. The acute stroke response teams were in place. There was processes with hospitals to do that protective code stroke and to ensure the safety of patients. One of the big debates across the country and across the world that I've heard from everywhere is this idea of, should we just automatically intubate now everybody going for endovascular for protection of everybody um, against COVID if we don't, because there's no way to know if they're it's been exposed or positive or negative going in. So that has been a major debate across the um, acute um, stroke field internationally. So one of our groups in Calgary published a paper on what a protective code stroke would look like, and that was in um, stroke in the journal Stroke uh, a couple months ago. Inpatient care became another issue for us 
and in our guidance we address that that many um, people were being cared for by non-stroke nurses all of a sudden because the stroke nurses who are highly skilled were pulled into critical care areas so we scrambled and um, put together an existing program on training patient support workers in the community to care for stroke we revamped that to address nurses and moved it into the inpatient setting so we were able to support that but really wanted to encourage um, care in acute and what was happening is because long-term care got shut down because in Canada we had a horrible problem with most of our cases were in long-term care that we weren't able to move seriously our patients out to long-term care and needed to keep them longer in acute. Rehab became a major issue so inpatient rehab within our guidance said that um, people still need to have that rehab because if we delay it now because of COVID, we're going to have much bigger problems later during the recovery and put increased burden on our health system. Um, our inpatient rehab folks were great at really trying to keep their beds open and trying to take patients a little faster from acute because of all the backlogs in acute and the higher risk um, in an acute care hospital and the rehab hospitals were very protective. So they were great at stepping up. We really encouraged that. We, um, we're really struggling with and having uh, support delivering rehab virtually and in person rehab, making that criteria on who needed to be seen in person and how to protect both the uh, patient and the rehab therapist in those encounters. And then really deciding what could be done um, virtually versus what needed to be done in person. One of the big challenges that we're examining them was many of the assessment and outcome tools that we use, like the six minute walk test and the MOCA, many of those have not yet been validated for a virtual environment. So our work now is really trying to sort through what can be reliably and validly delivered virtually versus needing to be done in person. In the secondary prevention, most of our clinics shut down, um, they switched to virtual, but there was a real problem with new patients patients you haven't seen before, there's only so much you can do virtually and at some point there becomes a critical point where you just need to be in the same room with that person to test some of their strengths and reflexes and things. But we really encourage that telemedicine be used and to provide some structure. The original close stroke checklist, which was developed by the World Stroke Organization and that we have adopted in Canada for many years, we really brought that back up and said, you know, in a structured environment, you, you need to structure the way you do um, your prevention and this is a great guide to make sure you fit all the important things. And we also have a structure for what should be done in a, a, a prevention. One of the big issues that came up was what about people on Coumadin? How can they get their INR checked? So there was a lot of, we put some guidance in around do they really need to be checked every week? If they've been stable for a long period of time, can you extend um, some labs were open, but can you maybe go two, three, or four weeks and manage um, COVID or manage their INR in the state of COVID? You know, some people have the machines to do it at home, but they're extremely expensive and the strips are 10 times the cost of a, a diabetic strip. But those are some of the issues that we had to address. So finally, in the community, home care support was really minimized. And patients were afraid to let anybody into their home, especially somebody who was caring for multiple patients in the community, even with proper donning and doffing in between the clients, that was a major issue. And there was a lot less staff because many of them had contracted COVID. Um, so there's all kinds of complications. We provided guidance that you know essential services should continue, safety is paramount, um, and provided some tools to help. The one thing we found was a big issue was supporting caregivers. They suddenly became the primary people without the healthcare provider support. It was, it was great emotional stress, great um, pressure while they're trying to be stuck at home with kids, dealing with aging sick parents who had a stroke and trying to maintain their work environment. So mental health was a major issue both for patients but especially for caregivers. And we throughout it offered 22 different webinars for patients, caregivers and healthcare professionals and we've got all kinds of resources that we were making available and updating in the context of COVID and really encouraging our patients and their caregivers to join our community of survivors. So at least they had a place to dialogue with each other and to find that support. And we encourage healthcare professionals 
to make patients aware of this because given the switch, they just weren't having the same time they would have preferred to have to counsel and support their patients. So COVID's had a major impact. We band together in an amazing way across the country, all professions, all specialty areas. And I think we did a, a fairly good job, but there's so much more to come and we have to use what we learn to prepare for the future. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Patrice. I'll move to our next speaker, and that is uh, Professor J. Raj Pandian. Uh, briefly, just to tell you a little bit about him, he is the Dean and Principal and Professor of Neurology at Christian Medical College, Ludhiana, Punjab, India. And he's the Vice President of the World Stroke Organization, as well as the President-Elect of the Indian Stroke Association. He's published widely on stroke care services, thrombolysis, and epidemiology in relationship to low and middle income countries. And he's the national PI for their Indian um, stroke clinical trial network called Instruct. So uh, we, we look forward to hearing your thoughts about COVID um, and stroke care in India. Thank you, Jay Raj. Yeah, thank you, uh, Puja. So uh, I'm going to talk about the challenges and, and, the, and the adaptations uh, that we have made in uh, India for stroke care uh, during this COVID uh, pandemic uh, uh, disclosures, none uh, relevant to this talk. So uh, this is a statistics um, uh, as of yesterday. Um, uh, we have uh, 2.6 million confirmed cases of uh, COVID and 1.9 million have recovered and the mortality is about 50,000, and we have about 670,000 active cases. And the way the cases have uh, emerged are mainly in the metropolitan cities like New Delhi, Mumbai, Chennai, Kolkata, and Bangalore now. And uh, uh, not all the states have uh, reached the peak, uh, but at different periods of time, uh, um, uh, the states have reached the peak, and in my state here, uh, we are at the peak now. Um, so the situation is uh, pretty bad, but one thing, I don't know uh, the, uh, the importance of this mortality. The mortality is about 2%. Uh, even otherwise, not only for COVID, our mortality for other diseases is not uh, very uh, accurate. And, uh, uh, but in practically, we, we see a very less mortality uh, of patients due to COVID. So challenges in stroke care and uh, a group of us from the Indian Stroke Association, we uh, did a, a nationwide survey of about 13 centers and this was published recently, looking at the problems and the challenges in stroke care. And uh, these are the uh, uh, places that we did the survey and uh, the survey included hospitals uh, from the federal government uh, and the state government-run hospitals and private hospitals. These are the, uh, the 13 stroke centers. These are the top stroke centers in our country. And what we found was there was 60% reduction in the number of stroke cases in these centers, and almost more than 60%, uh, almost probably 65% reduction in thrombolysis and close to 70% reduction in thrombectomy. So there has been a massive uh, decline in uh, stroke patients coming to the hospital and also people who receive thrombolysis and thrombectomy. And this slide summarizes uh, 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 the average number of cases uh, before COVID and after COVID, and it is uniformly same across all the centers and the average thrombolysis versus the, during the COVID period, pre-COVID uh, thrombectomy and uh, post-COVID thrombectomy. There are many centers where it's just zero and in terms of uh, um, issues related to uh, care of uh, stroke patients and, and also COVID in the emergency availability of PPE uh, in the early stages where uh, in a large majority of the hospital did not have uh, PPEs in the emergency and uh, the screening of patients, stroke patients who come to the emergency, some centers had uh, uh, immediate COVID tests available but most of the centers used screening questionnaire and then segregated them to the non-COVID area. And what about PPE uh, during thrombectomy? Maybe about 50% of the centers 
were able to use and uh, post thrombectomy care. Uh, th there's been major changes in post thrombectomy care and rehabilitation was uh, terribly affected in uh, many centers. So this is a summary of uh, uh, what uh, uh, had happened across the country in uh, top stroke centers uh, in India in a different category of hospitals. And uh, the Indian Stroke Association, we came up with a consensus statement uh, uh, reviewing all the uh, existing guidelines um, for COVID care and stroke, and also came up with our own uh, consensus statement, uh, uh, which is summarized in this algorithm. If somebody has a acute stroke um, and they come to the emergency department and there has to be a screening facility for COVID, and uh, uh, the uh, Indian Council on Medical Research has uh, approved a questionnaire by which you can uh, screen some of these COVID patients. If there's no suspicion and they will follow the routine uh, stroke code and uh, evaluation by CT and the admitted in stroke unit and the care is routine. But if there is a suspicion of COVID based on the questionnaire, if it is S and then they will go through the protected stroke code where uh, the rapid sampling and a designated corridor for shifting, designated CT scan, and your suite if they are eligible for thrombectomy and all protective measures had to be taken. And once they, are, they undergo thrombolysis or endovascular treatment and they get into the uh, COVID uh, uh, area, designated area, if it is test negative, then uh, standard care uh, will follow. And if it is positive, they'll be managed in COVID designated area. And if it is no, if the screening uh, is no, and then uh, it'll follow the routine care. But if the uh, COVID is uh, tested positive and it is not a designated hospital, uh, the recommendation was you refer to a COVID designated hospital where stroke care is available. If uh, uh, the shifting will take time, then try to manage with whatever protective gear that you that hospital has and uh, you can start treatment and uh, you know, consult with the uh, stroke unit or a comprehensive stroke center where uh, uh, COVID care is also available by uh, uh, telestroke or uh, telemedicine and don't delay the treatment. And in terms of uh, discharge uh, uh, um, uh, and rehabilitation, uh, the recommendation was largely uh, use telestroke uh, or telemedicine and telerehabilitation, uh, which many centers have uh, adapted. So this is the summary of uh, modification that uh, Indian Stroke Association has recommended uh, for the hospitals in our country to follow. And uh, there was another commentary uh, we had published in our official journal, Journal of Stroke Medicine, where uh, uh, my colleague and me, we reviewed uh, the global consensus and uh, reviewed the uh, Indian Stroke Association guide uh, uh, consensus statement and came up with a summary, uh, uh, which again uh, covers uh, uh, the same things, the continuum of care and uh, the care should not be affected. Try to use uh, uh, telestroke and telerehabilitation uh, as much as possible. The challenges, uh, uh, despite these uh, guidelines and statements that we have, uh, uh, patients are very scared to come to the hospital. Even patients who come within the window period, uh, they are scared to get admitted. I, the last Friday, I saw a, a patient in the clinic and uh, she came within a window period of eight hours and she had clinically LVO um, and uh, we uh, uh, did a CTA and there was LVO, but uh, she declined treatment. She did not want to get admitted and receive uh, thrombectomy even though she was eligible. And in our center, we were able to offer that, uh, but uh, we had to put her on aspirin and she was taken home. And uh, uh, sometimes uh, what we have seen is uh, the COVID-19 tests. Uh, 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 I think the last Sunday, uh, there was a patient who, uh, who had some respiratory symptoms and had evolving stroke. And she, the patient came to our emergency. And uh, the first thing they did was screening and the x-ray showed some infiltrates. And they said, uh, no, COVID test has to be done. And we do not have beds, COVID beds uh, uh, in the hospital. So the patient went to another hospital. On the way, patient developed weakness. And the, one of the, uh, the relatives of the patient called me. So they got the COVID test done, the TrueNet uh, rapid testing. It was negative. And so patient came to us and we admitted her uh, and it was out of the window period. 
uh, patient had a parapontoin infarct and we started treatment, but when we reviewed the CT scan of the chest and it showed classical ground glass appearance. So here the COVID test is negative, but the CT picture is very clear. So, and finally we had to consult with the internal medicine department and we shifted that patient to the COVID designate area. So uh, these are the challenges you know, within the hospital system, uh, even though we have all these screening tests, but, uh, and uh, uh, many of our healthcare workers are exposed, particularly in the stroke unit and uh, neurology ward when uh, uh, the screening is not appropriate. Uh, um, and as a result, many of our physiotherapists, nurses had to be quarantined. Uh, uh, even one of our neurologists also uh, developed COVID infection. So uh, these are the challenges, even though we have uh, measures in place, but uh, these are the challenges. And from the uh, uh, ISA Indian Stroke Association point of view and many of our neurologists, uh, we uh, uh, did a, uh, a TV program the last weekend, our Independence Day weekend, uh, uh, stressing on uh, that you know you need to identify stroke symptoms rapidly and uh, reach the hospital uh, in time. So uh, uh, another thing that has happened is the stroke trials so the, uh, in our Indian Stroke Clinical Trial Network. Uh, uh, currently, we have two ongoing uh, trials: recruitment and follow-up. And uh, the first trial, uh, we have to, both the trials we have to stop because patients were scared to come to the hospital. And particularly this particular, this trial where the Ayurvedic treatment has to be given one month in a, a, a Ayurvedic hospital, uh, patients uh, declined uh, admissions. And uh, so we are trying to find out some ways of uh, getting the follow-up information. And uh, at present, uh, we have stopped the recruitment of these trials. So take your message, major challenges in delivering stroke care, but still we can modify uh, uh, according to the uh, healthcare system that you uh, practice. Uh, emergency evaluation and acute care need to be reorganized, national international guidelines to be followed. And the most importantly, you know, interaction with the hospital administration and uh, tell them that a, a, a protected stroke code should be there uh, in the emergency department and also in the CT. Uh, and the other designated areas. So I will, uh, well, the future directions, yes, so we need to, in the coming few months, uh, definitely public awareness campaigns are important. And through ANGELS program, uh, we are able to continue the training of district government hospital doctors and nurses uh, by virtual uh, meeting using Zoom. And uh, of course, we all know the only way to tide over this pandemic is the vaccine. I'll stop here and I will uh, play a video. Um, uh, I will just show that. Um. Stroke or brain attack is one of the main causes of disability and death in India and in the world. In the current scenario of Corona pandemic, it is observed that the number of stroke patients admission in the hospital has reduced. This is to tell you that stroke is a medical emergency and needs to be treated as soon as possible. Let's be aware of what the stroke symptoms are so that we can recognize when the stroke happens and then we can go for the management ASAP to the hospital. So watch out for these symptoms. Remember fast where F stands for face and see whether there is any drooping of face on one side. A for arms. Can you raise both arms? S for speech. Do you have any difficulty in speaking? Time to rush to the nearest hospital. Remember, stroke is an emergency and you have only 4.5 hours to act on the symptoms of stroke. Rush to the nearest hospital with a CT scan facility. Our hospitals are following stroke protocols. So it is safe to be treated for stroke in stroke centers even in this current COVID scenario. <laughs> Stroke, 
ばなるね Okay, I'll stop here and、uh, yeah, thank you. Many thanks, Jeraj, for、uh, this excellent talk.、Um, I suggest that、uh, we move on directly to the last speaker and then we will have time for a question. So, the third speaker is、uh, Dr. Sheila Martins. She's a professor of neurology at the Universidade Federal do Rio Grande do Sul and coordinator of the stroke program at Hospital de Clinicas de Porto Alegre.、Uh, she is also the founder and president of the Brazilian Stroke Network, the president of the Ibero,、uh, Ibero American Stroke Organization, and vice president for the Stroke Support Organization at the World Stroke Organization. Thank you. I will share my screen. It's a pleasure to be here to talk about this important topic to show what we are doing in Brazil for the stroke in this、uh, pandemic time. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Here my disclosure. So, Brazil is a huge country with more than 200 million inhabitants with huge social, cultural, and economic difference.、Uh, we start with、uh, COVID 19 in February 26, was the first case who announced the pandemic in March 11. In March 16, schools were closed, and March 18 was declared social isolation. Inside the hospital, we have the reorganization of hospitals to assist COVID patients, restructuring for massive COVID care, creating in some、uh, states COVID hospitals, resizing of the emergency services, creating new pathways for COVID and no COVID patients, creating new areas for COVID. And with cancellation of all non urgency activities, outpatient clinic and active surgeries were cancelled. And the university was closed in、uh, teaching hospitals. We have a huge pro problem with lack of intensive care unit beds, ventilators, and masks. Uh, were created、uh, tents outside of the hospitals to, for triage of patients with, with respiratory symptoms to don't put the patients inside the emergency rooms. Were created field hospitals to assist patients. And now we are working like this.、Uh, we have social isolation in several cities and states, like my city is Porto Alegre, you can see here. But we have a lot of confusion in the orientations to the population, probably you saw in the、uh, media. You can see here in May, we have a huge crisis in Brazil. You can see a lot of people in the rooms, in the streets, without masks, with、uh, um, a terrible problem in several parts of the country without intensive care beds to assist patients. You can see here the situation. You can see here some patients inside the ambulance waiting for a bed in intensive care unit.、Uh, but we have a lot、uh, of compassion and solidarity. Here you can see the mission Amazon. We have doctors traveling across the country to help. Uh, areas without experience to manage these severe patients in intensive care units. And about stroke, we have in Brazil now 192 stroke centers in the country. You can see some regions without stroke centers, but the majority of countries have the stroke units.、Uh, inside the hospital, you reorganize the hospitals with new pathways for stroke. In new COVID areas. Several new neuro intensive care units and stroke units were used as COVID areas, but most stroke centers maintain their stroke units and stroke assistance regularly. We create a guideline to manage these patients in April. It was published in May. So,、uh, about safety of health professionals and patients, when patients arrive in the emergency room, he receives a mask. In areas with low number of case, cases of COVID and lack of、uh, personal protection equipment, 
the professionals use surgical mask or face shield. And the suggestion in areas with a high number uh, of COVID patients, and usually we suggest this for all uh, patients during the pandemic, all, all health professionals during the pandemic for stroke code, any 95 face shield, uh, full sleeve isolation gown, gloves, and surgical cap. So you are working like this, and all sharing outside the room. So we are using the full equipment for the stroke code. We start like this uh, with only mask, and now we are working like this with full protection to avoid contamination in the team. In the protocol, patients with uh, symptoms compatible with COVID-19 or contact with confirmed case in the last 14, uh, 14 days or patients unable to give information where um, uh, go to the root of COVID-19 patients. So patients with, uh, with less than 40, uh, 24 hours from symptom onset uh, go to activate the stroke code. So we perform CT, non-contrast CT. If patient were candidate uh, to thrombolyze, receive the bolus inside the, the CT scan, and after we perform CTA and, and chest CT uh, in some hospitals, uh, this was the suggestions uh, of gui guideline. Um, patient candidates for thrombectomy were treated with thrombectomy. So we didn't change the, uh, the medical protocol was the same, just the selection of patient for COVID or non-COVID patients. Uh, etiological investigation, we reduce the etiological investigation inside the hospital with CT, intra and extracranial CTA. Uh, EKG and no Doppler echocardiogram for all patients, only selected one, and no uh, transesophageal uh, echocardiogram only for endocarditis suspect to avoid the infection of professionals. Uh, triage who should be tested for COVID in patients without respiratory symptoms. Uh, we suggest to all stroke patients, and now in some hospitals, we are collecting RT-PCR for all stroke patients, and we are finding patients without respiratory syndrome, syndromes and stroke, but at least for cryptogenic strokes, we suggest to collect RT-PCR. Telemedicine was approved and used for pre-hospital acute care for several diseases and prevention and rehabilitation. Uh, we have neurologists trained in assisting patients as intensive care physicians to help uh, in the personal intensive care unit. We are using telemedicine in several ways inside the intensive care unit, only intensive care physicians are there, and sometimes the neurologists, neurologists when patients need an evaluation, but we are using to contact doctor to doctor and, and patient with families too. We have consultation from uh, some specialized hospitals to other hospitals without experience to assist uh, COVID patients. Ministry of Health create an app to monitor patients with symptoms in home. Uh, outpatient clinics by telemedicine for chronic disease with public hospitals and universities uh, together with the Ministry of Health was created, but without any plan for rehabilitation, the patients are in home without uh, any care. And about stroke patients arrive in the hospital because of social isolation, They're, they are afraid to go to the hospitals. Uh, COVID hospitals are the same stroke centers because are the big hospitals and patients are going to small hospitals without uh, stroke treatment. In some small hospitals and outpatient care, uh, health professional telling to patients with minor strokes and TIA to go home because it's dangerous to go to the hospital. So in the first month of pandemic was terrible. We have a publication during the first and second month in Joinville showing this here in the uh, February is vacation, we have low, a lower number of patients, but usually in March we have a higher number. You can see here increasing the number of COVID-19 patients and decreasing the number of patients arriving with mild, mild and moderate strokes in the hospitals. So we decrease in this time, 40, 50% of patients arriving with stroke in the hospital in the first um, two months of pandemic. Now we have the evaluation of 
17 hospitals decreased 20 to 25 percent of number of cases because with several campaigns in Brazil to aware the population together with angels program and with hospitals we increase the number of patients arriving to the hospitals but it still is uh, lower than before patients are arriving late without possibility of treatment, more severe and more young patients with the stroke. You can see here we increase from 10% of patients with less than 50 years old to 19% uh, young patients with stroke. This survey, Patty shared uh, the survey, Canadian survey with us. You can see here 80% of stroke patients uh, uh, have concerns about go to the hospital with a acute medical condition. You can see 55% of patients uh, have uh, canceled their consultations, uh, their appointments, and only 18% have teleconsultation. So 80% of uh, patients don't have any healthcare assistance in this period. Uh, is unacceptable that uh, the, uh, due to COVID-19 pandemic, we increase the number of people disabled by stroke due to not receiving treatment. Pandemic will pass, but the sequels of stroke are lifelong. So this campaign, Stroke Don't Stay at Home, we have every day aware the, to aware the population that they should go fast to the hospitals. We created Global Stoke Alliance in March. That was an initiative to stimulate a global alliance to improve stroke care worldwide. We have in this meeting, that was in March 11, when the World Health Organization launched the pandemic, with 20 countries together discussing the possibilities of implementation of stroke care with more, almost 600 people. And after this Global Stroke Alliance, that occurred during the first days of pandemic in the world, we launched Global Stroke Alliance Virtual. The fight must go on to, al to aware the population about stroke, to discuss uh, among specialists how to modify the rules for pandemic uh, for COVID patients and to educate the health professionals during this time. This is the situation of Brazil now, is the second country with more cases in the world and the second in number of deaths, 100,000 deaths until now. And unfortunately, we have increasing, increasing number of patients. In the last week, we are stable in this number of patients. Here is to thank to all health professionals across the globe. This is Cristo Redentor. To thank everybody that is fighting against this terrible situation we are now. And please believe that these days will pass. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sheila. Thank you, Patrice, Dayraj. Those were really um, important and well-spoken um, slides. I really appreciate just the frankness that you've shared some of the situations um, that we've all grappled with and um, some of the solutions that you've each uh, seen in your respective countries. Um, I think we've seen some some really good questions here, uh, some of which don't have easy answers, but we'll appreciate everyone's perspectives um, in trying to address them in these last 15 minutes. So uh, one theme that I appreciated right away um, in a few of the questions was, you know, um, how how we people would like to know kind of operationally how we are COVID-19 screening for our stroke patients, uh, particularly for endovascular therapy, and how that might acutely be leading to door to needle time delays. Is this just the, the current reality? Um, would any of the panelists like to, to speak about that question directly? So, uh, so can I start? Please do. Yeah. Uh, uh, in an ideal situation, uh, you need to have the uh, COVID testing. You know, even though we have the screening questionnaire, uh, now uh, many healthcare professionals are getting infected and uh, some hospitals, it's a protocol that every patient who comes to the emergency department has to undergo COVID testing. So as a result in that triaging process, uh, stroke patients 
uh, though you know they have to screen and triage and uh, uh, so there's a considerable delay happens and um, that is where uh, you know uh, uh, now we need to uh, involve the hospital administration and uh, so uh, currently in our uh, hospital what we are planning is um, you know s uh, triage is important and uh, even if uh, if it is a suspected stroke and we will uh, quickly do all the investigation imaging and uh, um, and send the test and take all the pr protective measures you know uh, whether you are doing the ct scan whether you are uh, going to do the uh, thrombectomy you know use all the protective measures and uh, keep them in a, a isolated area in your own ward and if the test is positive you know you need to ship them uh, uh, after the treatment is done, or if they are out of the window period, ship them to the uh, COVID designated area. So uh, we need to find some local solution, even though um, uh, there are guidelines and statements available, but we need to really look at a local solution uh, uh, if you have a diverse healthcare infrastructure. Any well, other uh, comments? Yeah. Sheila. Yeah, here, here the same. Uh, uh, all all team should assist patients with full protection. So stroke code, we have all full protection uh, because we don't know who is COVID or not. And uh, the same for endovascular treatment. They are treating patients with full protection. And uh, we don't have a fast uh, test here. So uh, we are testing in the, these several hospitals, we are testing all stroke patients, but we have the results in 24 hours, 48 hours. So uh, we have to consider all patients as possible COVID patients. So our door to needle time don't increase uh, because we are assisting all patients in the same way with full protection. So our, our door to needle time don't increase the time. For uh, um, thrombectomy, yes, increase the time for uh, door to puncture, but not uh, for door to needle time. Thank you, Sheila. You know, I will just make a brief comment that um, one that um, I, I think the tough part about the rapid tests is they're not, at least in most places, the antigen tests are not as accurate. So, so I think we also have to make sure our clinical suspicion is always carried. And I will take one moment to take the liberty of sharing my screen, which hopefully you can see here. Are you able to see that? Um, just to share with you our own solution that we published in the Stroke Journal um, in June um, and sort of provided a guideline for what we came together in our multidisciplinary group, which is that we're screening for you know, fever, um, hyper uh, or tachypnea, we're looking for symptoms, but frankly, more or exposures, but frankly, more often or not, the patient is unable to give a history and they are COVID-19 until proven otherwise. We're not doing the rapid tests. We're doing a semi-rapid test where we get 20, we get the results in hours, not, um, not those 30 minutes. And then we are, uh, we sort of have a protocol for how we mask and treat everybody. So just to share a reference for anybody who is looking for something concrete, there are probably other many um, excellent references there. And I would say that it's like, like you said, Jay Raj, it's very much solutions are local because um, these, the protocol I just showed you assumes that one, you have tests at all, and two, that you have PPE to be able to have everybody wearing appropriate um, gear. Any other comments on that theme? Let's move to see if we can tackle two more. We'll see how well we can do in 10 minutes, um, but at least one more. Uh, Guillaume, do you wanna, uh, do you see a clear theme there you'd like to raise? Well, let me keep going here. Um, I see a theme here um, and, and I think this is a really tough one, the fear of COVID. And I'm really struck by the example that you gave, Jay Raj, of a patient who actually had an LVO that was right there and didn't move forward with getting their artery opened. And um, how do we message more effectively? Because there's no doubt that you know COVID is a leading cause of death, but we're talking about stroke, which we have a treatment that, you know, for that patient, we have a one in two to three, for every three people we treat, we make one person better off than we would have otherwise. How do we, how do we, how do we help people understand this? 
Yeah, uh, I think it's um, it depends upon the education level of the family and uh, the patient whom I discussed. Uh, the uh, children were well educated, but uh, the uh, mother she was t totally adamant that uh, she did not want to stay in the hospital. And uh, but uh, uh, it again uh, varies from region to region in India. Uh, we uh, commonly see uh, not only during COVID time, but even for uh, uh, routine endovascular treatment, uh, uh, mechanical thrombectomy, the cost becomes an issue. And uh, even you tell them that we have some funds available to help them, and uh, sometimes they are totally, they say no, no. And uh, I think the education is very, very important, the background education of the family, the family members and the patient. Uh, that is very, very crucial. And, uh, and a lot of them uh, you know, uh, get convinced, but uh, uh, it takes time. You know, the Indian system where uh, you have a joint family and then they will talk to their family doctor. So that concern process itself, you know, it, uh, even for IVT, sometimes it gets delayed by 30 minutes or so. And uh, so it's a great challenge, yeah. You know, um, we found uh, that as soon as restaurants and schools closed, we weren't even in a COVID surge in Cincinnati, our stroke presentations just dropped by 40%. Mm -hmm. um, and you all spoke similarly of these issues. Um, and one of the messages that we put out in our press release was that, that stroke is really treatable, it's time sensitive, and that we actually know how not to transmit COVID now. At least we, we know that actually, at least I can say in my center, in the context of a moderate rate of COVID um, in the United States, that we are not having transmission any greater in our hospital than one would have in the community. So I'm able to say things like that, which we hope, we see our numbers going back up and we think it's helping, but I'm just, you know, it really comes down to how do you message this effectively that people understand? Patrice, do you have any thoughts there? For sure, and, um, you know, we are the organ, we in the Heart and Stroke Foundation, people turn to us. Like, they'll, they'll listen to the physicians, but they'll actually turn to us for the definitive answer as right or wrong as that may be. As the professional leadership organization that provides clinical guidelines. Yeah, and, and but also we're, we're an organization for people with lived experience. So our main audience is people who've had a heart, heart attack or stroke. And certainly with all the early press about ACE and ARB inhibitors and the interrelationship of the ACE2 receptor, you know, we were flooded with people calling us about what to do. I fielded many calls of, I've been having chest pain for the last 24 hours. I'm afraid to call anybody. What do you think I should do? You know, or I've been, my left side has been weak and I can't really, you know, do much. Do you think I should just wait it out? So we've done a ton of public education. Everything on our website has been, you know, having a heart attack or a stroke is far worse than having COVID. You know, in terms of long-term outcomes, right? And, and that it's not just the, you know, the risk is low. Hospitals have taken incredible precautions, you know, as everybody has said with total PPE, but the long-term impacts of delaying for every minute you delay, you're adding, you know, years of disability to that person's life and kind of changing it from the fear to the long-term impact and really pushing that into our public messages. It's not just about the first 72 hours. It's about what they're going to be left with in the long term. And, and that seems to be something that resonates more with people mm -hmm. is, you know, the impact that's going to have on caregivers, on family, on living situation, on future employment. Um, so we kind of turned it around a little bit. We acknowledge the fear because you can't just ignore it or brush it off. You have to acknowledge it. But at the same time, then, you know, kind of turn around the perspective. And that's how we've approached it. And, you know, we've had huge, huge public service efforts going on. Yeah. Well, and I think we have to say that there's some some situations we can't fix. There is a high level of generalized anxiety disorder, you know, that you know, with the social isolation only um, amplifying it, that even our best messaging can overcome. And like your patient, Jay Raj. Yeah. Sheila, anything to add there? Or should I go to the, try to sneak in one last quick topic? Go ahead. Oh, oh uh, yeah, we, we have huge campaigns here in, in 
TV, uh, TV and social media. In this week, we will have new program in uh, very important uh, TV uh, news uh, talking about uh, stroke and the patient should come uh, uh, fast to the hospital. So I think this is the message. Stroke don't stay at home is very strong and we should spread in the whole uh, country. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty black and white, but um, yeah. our, between our treatments and um, the effects of stroke that there is no doubt that, that it's worth the risk in almost, in almost all circumstances. Um, the last question that uh, theme that we saw was about, and, and this is, has probably, uh, again, doesn't have easy answers, is how to deal with loss to follow up, particularly in rural communities, po po impoverished communities without internet, and even deal with contacting patients when they leave the hospital for rehab, just that post, you know, post acute care setting. Um, you know, that's a problem even before COVID in, in many low and middle income countries, even having rehab access. I know, Jay Raj, you had your study trying to see if we could teach caregivers um, to provide that care. Um, there's uh, Steve Kramer's trial that published and showed that tele-rehab is non-inferior to in-person therapy with, um, uh, for motor deficits. But, um, but the, it's connecting the dots to that to a reality for a system that doesn't always exist is tough. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, I think uh, no, what has happened in India is um, uh, there has been a massive uh, uh, migration of people from one state to the, uh, their own native state. Uh, basically, the uh, laborers, uh, they had gone to, for example, from a backward state to a place like Mumbai or Kolkata or Chennai, when the COVID came, they lost jobs and they have to go back to their uh, own community. Uh, uh, so as a result, you know, um, uh, uh, many of the people, the rural folks had to change uh, places and uh, it was a great challenge to have follow-ups, particularly people who are enrolled in our trials and also uh, regular patients. In villages, they uh, uh, some of them, you know, they, with mobile, we are able to uh, manage follow up. And uh, tele uh, medicine uh, in India, uh, the government of India, with the Indian Council of Medical Research, they first time they come up with a telemedicine guidelines. So there are many uh, telemedicine portals available now in India, where uh, uh, by which uh, they are able to uh, manage the follow up. And the simple thing is WhatsApp video call. Uh, you know, uh, Smartphone is available uh, to a large proportion of the Indian population, and uh, but still, uh, you know, it's a great challenge to uh, keep them uh, under regular follow. -up. For rehabilitation, uh, I think tele rehab is another one which is really coming up in India during this uh, pandemic. People have come up with apps and uh, even uh, regular telemedicine portals using uh, smartphones, uh, uh, where people are using tele uh, rehabilitation and. Uh, so uh, I think people are slowly adapting to the situation. And Thank you, Jairaj. I, I know we're running a minute over, but I would like to allow a last comment or two from Patrice or Sheila on this topic. So some really interesting things that have happened locally. Um, one of the big issues has been access to technology. And we've actually had a couple regions where donors, private donors have given money to buy iPads for the local community center the local health center that they've then been lending out to people to enable some of that virtual care in rural communities. You know, the bigger issues are actually there's areas that aren't covered by, um, don't have any bandwidth at all, or don't have cellular service, but there's been some creative ways to, to reach out to those people through, and it mostly centered around the local health center, whether it be a nursing outpost or a smaller center that we've tried to help build those as the center point where um, they reach out to their local community because we can't from a you know from a big city reach out to all those communities but really kind of supporting a more regional local model and and helping work with those kind of centers and that seems to have helped in, in some areas so being a little bit more creative and you know solutions have to be close to home they can't be too far remotely removed that creativity, I think, is, is key, which I think we all have anecdotes, but sometimes it can be really tough to figure out. It can feel like such an insurmountable situation. I mean, it truly is in many ways. Mm -hmm. Sheila, any parting thoughts? 
Yeah, we are using uh, people that uh, don't have internet because a lot don't have internet. Uh, we are using a uh, cell phone to call to the patients to know how they are and to, av to advise them what they, what they have to do. So this is a solution, uh, intermediate solution, because almost all population have cell phone in Brazil. Yeah, we've been becoming quite aggressive about calling our patients even when they don't show up and trying to talk to them and yeah. guide them. Um, Guillaume, any parting thoughts? Um, not particular, maybe just one question. Um, um, are you aware of us professional who encountered violence during the pandemic? Because uh, this was raised uh, by a recent uh, report from the International Red Cross Committee violence during acute stroke care, in other words. Yeah. I thankfully am not uh, familiar with that, any of you, at least not in my local region. Good. Yeah. Okay. Well, I want to thank everybody so much. There, there are several more questions here um, that we would love to answer, and we'll see if we can um, put in some answers and thoughts um, as we, we part from, from you all. Um, there was a question about slides. Uh, all our speakers are happy to share their slides and uh, we'll send them out to attendees and I'm sure the World Struck Academy will help me figure out how to do that effectively. So um, I think in these tough times, um, there's some inspiring stories here. Um, and um, I think it's just, you know, persistence and education that is, the, is what we can do to move things forward. So I'll close by saying thank you so much. We had almost 200 attendees at the peak of the discussion and, and I'm really grateful to, to have this kind of a stroke community all together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much to our speakers. You were outstanding. Thank you. Thanks a lot.